Let's now turn to Fazila Raza, who is currently a principal advisor for the Office of Ethnic Affairs. Before that, she was a national operations manager there and an and the ethnic affairs advisor. Some of her key portfolios include the development of the Building Bridges Program, working with the Muslim community, uh, youth development and building links between research, policy and practice. She's also had various uh, research roles at the University of Auckland, focusing on community-based research with ethnic communities in the areas of health and wellbeing, socio-cultural determinants of behaviour and programme evaluation. And she has a master's degree in psychology with first-class honours from the University of Auckland. Thank you. Thanks, Joyce. I feel like that's a job application there, that my yeah. bio as well. <laughs> <laughs> but, would you me, Joyce? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, well, I, I, you know, time... Actually, you've got to make it <laughs> Lucky my boss isn't here. Um, we have a whole, you know, we've had a whole range of speakers, and I know time is short, so I'm going to try and, and keep it punchy and to the point. Um, I, I guess what where I'm coming from um, is very much my role within the Office of Ethnic Affairs, which you've heard about. But obviously, you can identify that I'm a visibly different um, ethnic person. I'm a New Zealand-born Fijian Indian Muslim migrant. Um, and I can relate to um, a number of the things that others have talked about as well as um, what the research was telling us. And so I guess everything I'm going to talk to you about is both from an office perspective but also infused with a little bit of my own experiences. Um, click to the next. I think we can maybe keep clicking in another couple of slides. Really what I took from the research was two things. Um, you know, Asian people are quite clearly the most discriminated against. But having said that, within a wider context, our experiences of discrimination in New Zealand are not nearly as bad as in, in the global context. And that actually, another thing that came out really strongly was that ethnic communities or migrant people come with a number of resiliencies, um, some derived from their culture, as Jim talked about, some derived from their ability to adapt. And um, those resiliencies, I think, are areas that we can build on, we can strengthen and we can support, as well as looking at how we might respond as a host society and what we might do. Uh, the real challenge that I'm hearing today um, from everyone is what are we going to do about this? What actions can we take? And I feel as an office, as a government department, um, this is an area which we are striving in. Um, we are a small organisation, so perhaps not making the, the dent in these issues that we'd like to, but certainly striving in the area quite hard. Um, Jim, would you mind clicking through to maybe slide um, nine? Nine, yeah. So if we think about where does discrimi discrimination come from, the etiology of discrimination, I think the research that we've heard about today as well as the, the body of research um, tells us that there are a number of different areas and it's very, very complex and we wouldn't be able to get into that entirely today. But for me, four areas that stand out which we can utilise and, and, and use as a pathway forward um, are around intergroup contact and relations. Um, and it's clear that the more contact we have with each other, the more intergroup contact we have, the more beneficial it is in terms of reducing discrimination. However, that intergroup contact must be of a particular nature and it must have um, you know, a number of um, features or, or we're not going to get the benefits that we'd like. The other area, I think, and, and one which is a, a fairly strong focus for the office, is intercultural competency or knowledge. And I, I think it's, it's a subjective statement, but I think that most New Zealanders are interested in other cultures, as other cultures may be interested in New Zealanders, but we don't necessarily have the skills or the competencies um, to know how to interact. And, and there's, there's, a, there's a level of lack of knowledge and a little bit of fear as well. And if we can build intercultural competency, um, we can promote better integrate relations. Um, the third area clearly is social policy, and, that, and that's another area that the Office of Ethnic Affairs is charged with. Um, and finally, economic drivers. Uh, we know that in hard times, recession and depression, um, discrimination and rac racial harassment tends to increase. And um, there's some very interesting research that's been done by um, Professor Manning Ip, where she shows the Chinese communities <coughs> have historically in New Zealand been a focus of uh, racism, particularly when um, economic times have been difficult. So I think that's something we should also consider. Thanks, John. Just the next slide. So if we look at what are we doing about discrimination, how are we tackling it? Um, <coughs> I guess a three-pronged approach is what's necessary, and 
I've, I've taken this from a, a report from um, Human Rights Commission, and I think it's a fair statement that New Zealand has a social, uh, sorry, a um, legal and political framework that is sound and that promotes harmonious relations um, and protects our freedoms. And we have um, channels by which we can make complaints and we can address issues of serious discrimination. So I feel like we have that legislative framework. Um, but maybe one of the, the issues that we could address is, is the low number of people maybe using that um, from Asian and ethnic communities. Um, but we also need government and societal measures. Um, government alone obviously cannot legislate or um, programise discrimination out, but it has a very clear role, it has a leadership role, it has a symbolic value as well as a practical value, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the practical things that we're doing. Um, but the third area is clearly the individual and community area, and I think throughout the presentations you've heard what communities are actually doing and what a number of people here are actually involved in, in tackling discrimination. Jim, could I have the next slide? So, um, the four areas that we focus on are intercultural competency and dialogue, um, promoting the benefits of diversity, and this is such an important area. I think most of us have um, a social justice sense of you know discrimination being wrong, but when this becomes an economic reality, when the imperative is economic, um, we have a number of um, strong drivers that are also going to push um, anti-discrimination and positive um, measures for inclusion. We also know that um, if we build the capacity of communities or build on the strengths that ethnic and other communities have, we can empower them to also be able to engage in this dialogue and, and tackle discrimination as they choose. And of course government responsiveness and access to services is essential. So here are, the, here are the priorities that have been set out by the government for the Office of Ethnic Affairs. Um, and as you can see, these align very much with the initiatives, obviously, that we're taking around the four key areas. I'll just have the next slide when, you're, when you can. Go. Thanks. Yeah. So when we talk about intercultural competency, I think there's a tendency for us to think um, can you tell me about your culture? How do I work with it? How do I say namaste? How do I say this? What should I do? The, the kind of the um, the essentials of a culture. And when I when we talk about intercultural competency, we're talking about something different. We're talking about an ability to be aware of how culture, your own and the person that you're interacting with, impacts that dialogue and that communication. So trying to move, I guess, the the, the notion of intercultural competency along. Um, to a, a slightly more sophisticated framework. Um, and what we've developed is a um, what we call an intercultural um, awareness and, co and communication training program, which we've been focusing particularly on government agencies, but we've, we've had a range of organisations being involved. And because we are such a small organisation with limited resource, um, our focus is around training the trainers. So getting um, organisations to be able to train their own people around yeah. intercultural competency. Um, I also wanted to, to mention, I think, was a, was a very challenging project that we're involved in, and Teva, who's here, um, was a, you know, a key a project leader of that, and that was around authentic dialogue. Um, Post-September 11th, obviously, there was a whole range of issues for Muslim communities, but what we thought we would try and do is develop a programme where we could go into schools and talk with young people about their perceptions of, of Muslims and of other ethnic groups. And um, very challenging, very complicated, very difficult, but, but also quite successful. Um, and we were able to use that as a base for developing a, a range of, of, of initiatives and a whole program around authentic dialogue, which we've currently targeted with educational institutions, because I think um, Young people with, with young people, there's a huge opportunity to create awareness and change in attitudes. So that was one of our, our key projects in this area. We also do a number of visibility initiatives, and that's about um, how long do I have to? No time. I'm out. Okay. Um, we also do a range of visibility initiatives around promoting um, the the idea of ethnic communities in a public space. So not just festivals, but um, arts and a whole range of dialogue initiatives. I don't have long, but I have no time. 
no time at all. But um, what I wanted to finish on, I guess, is around the benefits of diversity and this whole new stream of work that we're engaging with. Um, I'm sorry, if I forgot your name, but your, your research pointed to the to, to the role of the SME. And if we're talking about employment as perhaps the most significant um, barrier for Asian peoples, um, we really need to, this is where we've put some, a huge amount of energy. Um, and one of the roles that we have is to promote, uh, promote and, and build skills around <coughs> diversity management. Um, and we have a number of programs that we're developing in this area around recruitment and retention of ethnically diverse staff, which is a challenge. I mean, even in an organisation like our own, where diversity is the norm, ethnic diversity is the norm, it's a challenge. So, um, yeah, SMEs, I think this is one of the actions that we're taking, and we also have a publication around riding the wave. Um, can I do one last slide? Not the next one, but the, yeah. Um, and beyond that, I guess promoting the benefits of diversity in a, in a wider sense around um, trade um, and, you know, all the FTA stuff, all the things that are happening currently, um, our engagement with ethnic communities around this is, is huge and connecting mainstream business with ethnic communities. Um, we've had a number of successful events around, around this area. So uh, yeah, I'd just like to end on that note, and if anyone wants any more information, there's a number of us here from the office who could help with that. Thank you. Okay. Um, I forgot to say at the beginning that this is just a foretaste of an ongoing discussion, um, because I don't think we're gonna be able to have it here. Um, and I, I'm just going to do a couple of advertisements. Uh, one is please come to the reception this evening and stay for the Diversity Awards. Uh, you're most welcome. Uh, and do stay for another forum if you wish. Uh, and then I'm going to ask Leanne, uh, who actually is known, to, I hope, to all of you as a local member of Parliament and a former minister, uh, to, to do the job that I was going to do, which is to respond to what everybody has said. <laughs> in two and a half minutes. And Jim will tell you when. <laughs> and then you need to rush off and have a cup of tea. So thank you very much, Leanne, uh, former Minister of Immigration. Minister It'll of do. <laughs> Thank you. I'd, like to use, I'd like to use my time productively. Um, as you've heard today, the paper uh, deals with discrimination and employment and also uh, racial harassment. I was going to focus uh, more on the latter rather than the former, but now it's my job to kind of gather the threads together. Um, when I was uh, Minister of uh, Immigration, one of the biggest problems that I saw was around Asian um, migrants to New Zealand who couldn't find work in their field of expertise. And that, that issue around saving face, that was the biggest issue because it was such a cultural shock to come to another part of the world and then find that you weren't able to support your family in the way that you had expected to be able to. Um, and that's why we switched the general skills category to the skilled migrant category and that was to try and get rid of this problem of people who were in New Zealand with a job who couldn't get residence and people who who were in another country who couldn't get a job or, or who had residence but couldn't get a job. And that was, um, that was a terrible thing. And the underemployment, the qualifications and skills. I have met taxi drivers, uh, Korean pharmacists, uh, a Russian um, uh, nuclear physicist of all things. You know, uh, people in different um, jobs, stacking shelves in the, in the grocery stores and in the, in the supermarkets, driving the taxis was the classic, the doctor's driving taxi scenario. There's no question that discrimination still exists, but at least we were able to reduce um, the numbers being added to the pool in this category, but there is more work that needs to be done. We started using local business networks to get migrants um, into, into work who were into skilled jobs. The New Kiwis web website was a partnership with the Auckland Chamber of Commerce, and here the Canterbury Employers Chamber of Commerce played a leadership role in getting people engaging directly with small business. So that certainly um, started to see a bit of a difference. The reason I wanted to talk about the um, racial harassment though was because um, I participated in an anti-racism rally here in Christchurch in 2004, and it sparked off a real debate about whether we should be using that word um, racism. And I asked one of my friends on the march, I said, have you ever experienced racism in New Zealand? Um, he, he was born in Malaysia. 
Um, and he told me about an experience that had happened the previous year. He turned up at uh, the Christchurch border and striking up a conversation as you do at the border with the customs officer, IRS strategy, um, he, observed that it was, he observed that it was very cold. The response was, you can always go home if you don't like it. <laughs> now, Christchurch wasn't home. He wasn't going home, he was coming home. And it was, I was shocked, absolutely shocked. And what that meant for me was that I started asking a lot of my friends who are from different backgrounds whether they had experienced any form of racism. And I started to hear these stories of being yelled at to go home, the obscene gestures, and having rubbish thrown at them from moving cars. They, they were all common experiences. And I couldn't believe it because no one had volunteered the information to me. And that is because I actually think people do suck it up. They do just take it. And they think, well, there are bigger issues to fight. I want this place for my family. And I'm just going to take this in order to get on uh, with my life. Now, my awakening to this experience can be likened to the debate that we're about to have on alcohol. Um, until I went out after midnight and saw for myself how the dynamics had changed, with young adults preloading on cheap alcohol before they hit town, I would never have known what the problem was. I couldn't have understood it. The cartoon in this morning's <coughs> press speaks volumes showing the government's reform package as air freshener to cover the smell of the dead elephant in the room, which is labelled easy access to cheap alcohol. That is the problem. The elephant in the room here is racism and institutional racism. And it's also a level of prejudice and um, a, a lack of understanding. Racism and prejudice, in my view, are fueled by ignorance and fear replace them with knowledge and understanding and you start to address the problem. And that's where the solution is to be found. The solution, the antidote is in the paper. People's feelings about Asians were much warmer if they had a personal involvement with people from Asia. Getting to know our new neighbours must be the answer. So, the first point is, and I know that I'm over time, that we, we shouldn't look to central government for the solution except to tell us to shut up about um, fueling the problem. You know, I mean, there are certain politicians who make a habit of doing it and they're on the comeback trail, so I just <laughs> warn, you know, that that's not the way to get the sort of society that we want. But gov central government can help with resourcing local solutions. And I think one of the truly short sighted decisions of our current council was to remove the funding and the secretariat support for the intercultural assembly, which folded as a result. If we're going to see open and honest debate around these issues, we need the debate led by these kind of assemblies that bring together ethnic communities, receiving communities, it's a partnership, and tangata whenua. The three strands have got to be brought together in order to have the debate. And I'm hopeful, and I know this is a very political statement, that a refreshed council we will revisit that decision so Christchurch has a platform for addressing the reality of the experience of our Asian migrants, visitors and students, and they can then develop the forums for the getting to know to happen. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who has um, uh, made a presentation and my apologies that there hasn't been time to discuss that. But surely this is a conversation that must continue. Uh, and anybody who wants to be a part of that conversation, email me. So or email the centre or email New Zealand University. Let me add a phrase because we, we did run out of time. And um, what will happen is the centre also has partnered uh, with a website called issues.co.nz. And we will be posting these materials. We've got many people's emails. We'll put you on there. And you can add your comment to it, because we would like to get a broader level of input in order to try to create an action wave coming forward. So thanks again. So that, that, that issues code in as well as Thank you very much. Have a quick cup of coffee. See you in another session.